Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter and welcome to another video. This time we're going to take a look at uh, one possible uh, Git GUI, which is a graphic graphical user interface uh, that you can use uh, to operate um, the Git version control system uh, on the daily. Uh, in this video, we're going to take a look some uh, at some of the simple things you might want to do, which is creating a new repository, committing a couple of changes, main, making branches, maybe merging them. Uh, if we have enough time, we're going to take a look at um, uh, merge conflicts, but and of course, uploading these repositories to GitHub and managing them. So um, first of all, uh, you're going to need a uh, you, you're going to need git installed on your machine. If you don't uh, have that, I recommend you check out the last video uh, where we went through some of the basics about git, what a commit is, uh, what merge, uh, what uh, branches and merges are, uh, which is basically the fundamental knowledge that uh, you're going to sort of need, or it at least gives you a great advantage if you if you do know uh, in this video. Now, there is a plethora of uh, different uh, graphical user interfaces for Git. Uh, you might have heard of some, maybe you've heard of Git Kraken, maybe a GitHub for desktop, maybe Source Tree. Um, the one that I'm going to demonstrate in this video and that I'm going to recommend for now, um, and, and I highly recommend that you experiment with different uh, GUIs to find the one that you like. And I'm going to also show you a no GUI way, basically uh, using it from a command line um, in some other video, because that might be your preferred way it is for me. Uh, but I don't, uh, I completely understand um, how maybe using a GUI might be uh, beneficial for some. So uh, the one that I'm going to recommend is called Git extensions. It sounds a bit like, you know, it's like part of Git. Maybe it gives you more features of Git. Uh, it really doesn't. It's a uh, it's a graphical user uh, interface. Uh, you can find it at git extensions .github .io. And um, uh, well, you probably haven't heard of Git extensions. And if you if you if you have, then I think this tutorial is slightly too simple for you. Um, but again, your 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 case might uh, be different. But um, basically, the reason why I uh, choose this is uh, twofold. Number one, it is written in C sharp mostly. I mean, there's a bit of C plus plus, even some VB script, JavaScript, and Python, but mostly in 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 C sharp. I'm pretty sure these would be for the website as well, I mean, JavaScript at least. I think um, I'm getting off topic already. Uh, it's not. This is this is why I shouldn't make tutorials. Um, anyway, so this is written in C sharp, which is obviously a a, a theme or, or a topic on on my YouTube channel. Uh, and it also has a GPL3 license, which is gener uh, GNU uh, General Public License V3, uh, which makes it a uh, free as in freedom software. And I think where possible, it's um, better to use um, free and open source software, especially if you're not already tied into a proprietary solution. Um, Unless, of course, you have such a use case where um, a proprietary application would give you uh, much more, um, I don't know, use, I guess. Uh, and it doesn't, and I mean, as long as it doesn't bother you that you're using a proprietary application. But again, that's my rant over. Uh, how do you get this? Well, you can click the little download uh, button over here, which is just going to redirect you to the releases uh, page. Actually, I think it, uh, it excludes the pre-release. It gives you the latest stable if you click download. Let me double check that. It does. That's the latest release. Uh, you simply click here to download the MSI package to install it on Windows. Um, you, if you don't want to, if you don't want to install this, uh, you can also download the portable version, which is just a really nice way. Maybe you're at um, at a uh, at your school computer, right? Maybe you just want to version control something real quick, uh, clone a repo, that sort of stuff. Um, and Git is already installed, I guess. I don't know. That's a weird use case. Um, so. That's how you get this application. Uh, another thing that uh, might be beneficial is as if you have any uh, problems or uh, a question, you can always uh, open a new issue in this um, in this repository, and you're basically 
uh, easily in touch with the developers. And of course, if you are a developer yourself, you can contribute, uh, which I think is amazing. And you can also learn how, the, how this thing even works, right? Um, so that's why I would recommend this. Now, we have it uh, installed. I have it here, Git extensions. Uh, let's take a look at what it uh, does. So if I if I open it here, I'm going to see a fairly standard empty uh, repository selection screen where I obviously don't have any. If you use this, you're going to see uh, your latest uh, used uh, repositories, uh, similar to maybe uh, a welcome screen of uh, screen, not screen. Uh, of Visual Studio. It'd be really funny if Visual Studio had a welcome scream. It would just like yell at you like, I need an update or like you need to reboot. I would not be surprised. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to create a new repository. Now it's going to ask us about a directory. Where do we want to uh, create this repository? I'm just going to hit browse and I'm going to go to my desktop just for uh, simplicity sake. And I'm going to like maybe like have a folder called work. Uh, and in work, I'm going to select this folder uh, and create a personal repository. Uh, they have an option for a central repository with a no working directory, uh, a so-called bare repository. Uh, we're not going to delve into that. Maybe we're going to take a look at bare repositories in uh, future videos. Because uh, if you're on Linux, maybe managing your dot .files or a home directory like that would be beneficial. But again, I'm getting so off topic. Let's focus, right? So that this video isn't 42 minutes and 37 seconds. It'd be really funny if it genuinely was. All right. So I'm going to hit create. And it initialized empty git repository in there. Work that dot git. And it isn't lying, actually. If I go to this uh directory here there really is a an empty git uh, or sorry a dot git hidden uh folder if you don't see that you can go to views hidden items you can see that it's not there if i have it unchecked if i have it checked it's there uh we don't want to touch that that's where git uh uses uh, that's where git stores all of the repository information uh, we're not going to mess with that uh but just so you know it's not magic you know the whole tree and all the commits are in there uh they're not like magically stored uh, in the ether. So here's the thing. Uh, one thing that I like here is that uh, this uh, GUI gives us a, uh, a good uh, sort of startup option. It says, hey, this repository does not yet contain any commits. And we have two, um, two options. We can edit a .gitignore, which is a file that we're going to talk about shortly, or we can commit, but we have nothing to commit yet. So we want to create that initial first commit. Uh, so just to do that, I'm going to uh, open up uh, my favorite uh, terminal application, which is Commander. I'm going to go to desktop work. And in here, I'm just going to basically get some code up and running. Let's make a directory called source. And in source, we're just going to dot that new solution called like my work, right? Uh, I'm going to make a new solution file. Let me actually open this folder just so you can maybe like kind of see uh, what I'm doing. And then we're also going to, uh, this is not, this is by the way, not relevant to the Git um, uh, Git uh, tutorial, you might also create a solution or a, a project, uh, whatever you're working on uh, the standard way from Visual Studio or any other way. I'm just demonstrating how you might, you know, uh, do some work. So obviously I'm creating a project here. I'm going to create a new uh, console application. I don't know, call it my work dot console app, right? I'm just gonna, I'm just creating some basic things that we can, um, we can then, um, used to track to, to to just demonstrate some uh, good things on right so i'm gonna have a dot net uh, i'm gonna add the console app to our solution and i'm gonna dot net build it all right so now that i have i've got an application basically up and running really uh, it's a hello world application nothing uh, crazy we've got a couple of files uh now we can go back to our um Get GUI, and we can take a look at the commit options because maybe uh, if you haven't seen it earlier, this little commit button had a zero uh, after it, meaning there was nothing like no changes, nothing to uh, commit, um, nothing staged, but nothing in the in the index either. Uh, now it says twenty five, so it obviously sees our changes. Maybe if we if we go through like here, 
maybe we, we can see somewhere where the changes really are. I'm not completely sure. Now, do we have to click the, the, the commit button? I don't know. Let's see GUIs. All right. So if we click commit, yep, it's going to show us, ah, that's where our, that's where our diff uh, is showing. Uh, once I click commit, it shows me everything that I added in this case. Um, and what I can do is I can pick specific things to, um, make commits from, right? So I don't have to commit all of the changes that I've done. I can pick and choose what to include in a commit and it's uh, better. It is recommended to do that um, so that uh, your commits can be descriptive, right? So for example, what I can do is I can just include the solution file. And I mean, in this case, it doesn't really make too much sense because the solution file already includes references to uh, the console application, which is obviously not going to be there. But maybe I just want to commit the solution file alone just for the sake of this tutorial. It might be just a set of changes that you are working on. Maybe uh, that's the first draft. Maybe that's uh, just one module. Uh, maybe you're fixing one bug in like a comp like front end application, right? And then a different commit for the back end, but you ne needed it to work together. So you made the changes all at once. And then you want to commit the front end changes separately uh, and the back end changes as well, right? So I'm going to basically like select all the files that I want in which in this case, it's just a solution file. And now I need to fill in this little form. Now, this is just a preview again. If I click it, it just shows me uh, what changed. Uh, red is what uh, got deleted and green is what got added. And you can see that there's a little dev null. And it's like, so what was there before? Dev null is just nothing. It's a, it's an empty, it, the file didn't exist before. Um, this is just a little quirk of, um, of this particular, um, this particular uh, GUI. But what I need to fill is here, I need to fill in a commit message. Uh, the way commit messages work is the first one, the first line is used for the title. So I'm going to maybe do something like uh, add solution file. And then you can uh, leave like uh, you can enter. I think once is enough. I like to enter twice and uh, write a description of your commit. Um, so it's like, uh, at the solution file for the project. Now, um, obviously, uh, you might want to be more descriptive. If the commit was more involved, you would want to type what you did, right? What actually changed? Uh, not not necessarily to a point where you're basically rewriting the code, but maybe just additional information. It is also also okay to leave the description out. You don't have to include a description with the commit, but it's better to uh, remember to. Uh, you know, specify, it's better to be more verbose with your commits rather than being less verbose. However, there's one uh, important rule and that's to keep the title very simple uh, and then explain the rest in the description. Now, in this case, I literally just created a solution file. There's nothing like really, I don't think the description is needed here. I wouldn't do it in, in a real, uh, in a, in a real project unless I wanted to practice. Uh, and of course, I don't think I would commit just a single solution file in this case, but, uh, you know, just to, just to practice, I would recommend that you try, try to do this. Now, uh, another thing that you might want to do in a, a commit message is adding a co-author. Um, this is something that's very like GitHub specific. Um, in this case, the way you would do that is you would type in co dash author, uh, column, and then you would type in, uh, basically the, the committer, uh, handle, which the committer handle, as you can see here, uh, is taken from my, uh, my git config, which is in this case, uh, like, like you would, you would type in that for whoever co-authored that with you. So for example, if I did it with, uh, if I, if Drax, uh, if Drax has helped me, I will type in Drax codes. I'm pretty sure that's his GitHub username, uh, Drax codes at uh, users.noreply.github.com. Uh, that's obviously referencing his GitHub username. So if I go to GitHub 
and go to github.com slash draxcos. I'm pretty sure that's going to be draxcos. Yep, I remember my friend. Uh, so in this case, I'm basically telling in the commit message that I didn't do this alone. This was actually done with draxcos. Maybe we pair programmed, you know, maybe he helped me solve an issue. Uh, it's really good. It's uh, nice to, to reference that just so people know who actually changed the, the, the individual lines of code, right? Codes, right? Maybe I'm going to be sick or no longer working on the project, but Drexis still is, so people can ask him instead of hunting me when we did it together. Um, I think that's uh, about it. That uh, That's about it for the commit messages. One more thing uh, that's a bit of a standard, it's not a hard requirement, but it's very, very common, is to write the titles, the, the git, uh, the commit titles in uh, an imperative mood, which basically means you can imagine a little this commit will in front of your uh, commit message and has to make grammatical sense. So usually people type something like added solution file, but obviously if you imagine uh, that it says this commit will added solution file is obviously uh, not uh, grammatically correct so you would you would type it as an add um, this is just a bit of a standard uh, if you want to if you want to do that um, that's uh, just going to make you I guess make your life easier in some projects some projects require it all right so that's it I don't think we need to take a look at the, any more of like these uh, different uh, options we can just hit we filled it we can hit commit now it's for me. It's going to require a, um, a GPG encryption key. That's because I have my uh, commits set up as um, I have my commits um, signed, which basically gives you like a little check mark uh, in your repository. I don't think I have any repository at this point where I could show you that. Uh, but make sure that nobody can just like pretend to be me. We're going to take a look at how to set that up as well. One thing that I forgot to mention is probably that we should go into some of the Git uh, options. Um, I haven't done that through the GUI yet, and I was about to explain it with um, just using just using a uh, command line. But maybe we can actually set up our little our little. Um, Config, yes, config. So, okay, so so the path to it is uh, tools, settings, uh, git, config. You can see that I, even though I have never actually like used this, uh, it was pretty natural for me to find the settings that I needed. Um, I think I, I think that's a very important thing. You can even search here, which is really good. So in our git config, the important thing that we want to uh, set up is the username and user email. And you should have done that. I'm sorry for this, but you should have done that before you created the repository and committed, obviously, because the commit needs to um, be set up. And I'm pretty sure that maybe if you didn't have this set up and you would try to commit, I'm pretty sure this application would ask you, hey, like, what's your username? What's your email? So you would want to fill that. Here's a little t tip and trick. Uh, you can use your GitHub username. And if you don't want to, uh, like, publicly, you know, broadcast your email address, you can always use your GitHub username at users.noreply.github.com, right? And it will work. Or if you don't want to, if you like, I'm working, I've, you, you know, you remember that I, um, co-authored Draxis and I didn't know his, I don't remember his, um, I probably remember his Gmail address, but maybe I, I don't. And in that case, uh, I can be sure by using his um, uh, basically users anonymous, like it's not really anonymous, but like a common sort of uh, user email address on GitHub. So you would apply that and uh, there we would. So you can see that it also pulls a little uh, my avatar from GitHub, which is really nice. Um, and obviously, I have a uh, commit here, and it and it um, also created a master branch. But what I would like to do now is actually uh, have this repository be on GitHub. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I intentionally did this out of order because it's I think more beneficial for you to know how to make a new repository and then upload it to uh, GitHub as opposed to just cloning it from GitHub and like having a, having a free pass there. So what we're gonna do here, I'm gonna be I'm I'm here on GitHub. I'm going to hit the little plus button, hit new repository, and I'm gonna say let's put it in the uh, programming with Peter just so it's a tutorial. So tutorial repo, and I'm gonna just uh, a git repository from a tutorial. Uh, and uh, okay, I'm gonna make this public. 
uh, and I'm not going to initialize it with anything. I'm not going to select a gitignore. I'm not going to select a license. I'm not going to uh, check the readme because I want this repository to be bare because we're going to push into it. So basically, I'm going to hit create repository, which gives me this blank page. It's not really blank. It has a lot of weird instructions, even some code snippets uh, that you can use, you can, you can actually follow. But what we're going to do here is we're going to we're going to now uh, push our changes into this git uh, this git repository and we have uh, we can do that using uh, one of two approaches now to interact with github github somehow needs to know uh, who you are and how you can authenticate right uh, so that you know not, not anyone with this link, with a link to the, your repository, can just push into it. So obviously GitHub uh, needs some way of authenticating. And the simplest and, and probably easiest way is HTTPS, which is basically just going to have an OAuth2 flow. It's just going to ask, it's going to like pop up and be like, hey, like, please log in with GitHub. Uh, but a more traditional or a, I, I would like... I don't know if it's genuinely more secure, but I can tell you that it, in practice, is the most uh, used one because some uh, some um, repositories might not have the H the H the OAuth two pipeline. For example, you could have a instead of GitHub, you can have a GitLab. Your company can have a GitLab, and uh, they might have uh, HTTPS disabled, so you have to actually have an SSH key. So we're going to talk about this. You can go with HTTPS for now, but just know, and I'm going to probably make a special video about the, HT, uh, the SSH authentication, but just so you know, it's not that difficult and you can go through it. If you go, if you just um, open up your favorite search engine, mine is DuckDuckGo, um, and if you just type in uh, GitHub SSH, uh, one of the first results is connecting to GitHub with SSH. And this is a brilliant documentation that walks you step by step, uh, step by step of how you know what you're supposed to do. So uh, one thing that we need to do is we need to generate an SSH key and add it to apparently the agent. Then we need to add the SSH key to GitHub, and then it's that's basically done really. So two things. First thing is generating the key. It's nothing difficult. For example, in Windows, you just follow these steps. You just copy paste these these commands, right? You just replace this with your GitHub email. That's the only important thing. So you just use this little command with your email. It's fine. You go through this. You just enter like a little passphrase. You can, like so that you have a password on your key in case someone like steals it off your machine. That's one thing. And then you find the 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 key. Uh, copy the contents of it, and you simply go to settings, SSH and GP, GP. I think it's these days it's uh, actually separated. So if I go to settings, it's oh no, actually it's still the same. So SSH and GPG, you can see that I have a plenty of uh, plenty of different uh, different keys that I use, and you would just like register it, and um, that's it. So then you would be able to authenticate with uh, with SSH. So now. How do we connect this repository, which is local at the moment, um, with our remote repository? So that's a good question. So what we need to do here, we're going to hit the little GitHub option here. We're going to say add upstream remote, which basically should say, can I find any relevant repository host for the current open repository? Yeah, well, that uh, can we just add a remote like that? All right, I was pretty sure that that would do it, but you know what? Mistakes is how you learn. And this gives you a really good, like a nice example of like, okay, something went wrong. So what do you do? Like, how do you try to debug this, right? Obviously I thought this was the way to go. Apparently it's not. So what we're gonna do is we need to add this as a remote. So number, so we either can, uh, I obviously know how to do it from here, push it uh, an existing repository, which in this case said, uh, you just add a git remote add origin and then the uh, SSH path, which is basically this SSH link. So I'm going to copy that because we're definitely going to need that. And they say like the command basically tells us what we need to do. It told, it says remote add origin. Okay, so I see remotes over here and I'm pretty sure I can add a new remote. I can manage remotes. 
Okay, so let's manage a remote. And it looks kind of complex and like wild, but what is the name of the remote? Well, it said origin. Origin. Let's go. What is the URL of the remote? Yeah, sure. This this little uh, SSH uh, URL that we copied. Separate push URL. I don't think we need to have a separate push URL. And um, can I? What do I do? Add a new remote. You think create new remote? Save changes. You have added a new remote repository. Do you want to automatically configure the default push and pull behavior for for this remote? Yes, sure. Configure whatever you want, my friend. Origin. So we've got origin now. All right. So in this case, uh, if I go to remotes, now I can see that I have this origin remote. And it also has a little GitHub icon. So it knows that it's from GitHub. Okay. Okay. So can I, this is the big question. Can I push into it? So there's obviously this little uh, arrow pointing up, which uh, that's high. I mean, I kind of assume that it's push. And if I hover over it, it's definitely push. Um, I'm going to click push. It's like, okay, uh, to origin, uh, master, master, push. This brand, uh, the branch you are about to push seems to be a new branch for the remote, right? Basically saying, hey, uh, there's no branch here. Uh, are you sure you want to push this branch? Which is a good question. It's like, whoa, what if we're accidentally pushing into a different, into a wrong repo? But like, yeah, actually, we want to create the master branch on there. And it says the branch master does not have a tracking reference. Do you want to add a tracking reference to master? Basically, what a tracking reference? It's like, but like, you, you can you can probably infer it. Just think about it, right? Tracking reference. Well, tracking reference is basically saying, hey, should I like keep keep an eye out on what's going on on the origin if origin changes should i like let you know that your master your branch is actually like not up to date and you need to fetch and it's like yes of course yes i need that um well, i don't need it but it's definitely beneficial so all right so now you can see that we have a little we uh, we have a little branch called master that's that's our local master but we also have an origin master and if i check out the uh, git repository and i ref refresh you can see that we have our files here there's src there's our solution file and if i go to commits click commit right i can see that this is indeed the commit and if I hover, there's co-author, and I think I screwed up the co-author. I'm pretty sure it's actually supposed to be co-authored by. Um, now, that's a good thing because now we can try to change this commit. What if we try to amend it? Now, amending a commit is basically changing it. So let's see how we would do that because we want to change the description, obviously, right? So one option is to just hit commit and then hit amend, but uh, I'm pretty sure there should be uh, there should be a way. Uh, check out this commit, revert this commit. Reverting would be would be horrifying at this point. Um, that would create a new commit, which is basically an inverse of what uh, what we did. Uh, I know how to do it from. Uh, uh, we, we could, okay, we could do a rebase, an interactive rebase from this point, which is like, that seems like a waste. Can we just go, let me see if I can do it. Oh, yes. Ah, so it's a sneaky one. It's a sneaky one. There's no amend commit um, button, or at least I haven't found it. Um, what we can do if it's the last one, if we want to amend, amend or change the last commit that we've made. Uh, then it's simple. You just hit commit. You do not add anything. Just hit amend commit, which is going to like use the one that was done previously. And we're going to co authored by. And I'm pretty sure well, I'm going to like double check that GitHub. Uh, just so, just so maybe we know. Uh, we wrote this together. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's not helping. Thanks. Yeah. Co authored by. This is how you do it, right? So obviously co-authored by, I'm just going to make sure that it's easy for GitHub to pick it up, co-authored by, and I'm going to hit commit again. Now it's going to be like, you're about to rewrite history. Only use amend if the commit is not published yet. Here's the thing. I'm going to say that I want to com uh, continue. The problem is um, it is published already. Now, why is it bad? 
And why is it here twice? So there are two things. So first of all, it's here twice because on our master branch, there's this commit on the origin uh, or on the origin master on basically on GitHub's master. There's the same commit, but it's a di no, it's not the same commit. There's a different commit. You can see that it has a different hash because the description changed. So um, why is it not OK to why, why was there a little warning that says, hey, only do this if it's not published yet? Well, so the reason is someone already might be working on uh, this repository. I mean, it's not true if um, if only if it's your if you're the only person working on this project, obviously you don't have to uh, take care uh, of other people. But if this was a team effort and someone already uh, made a branch off of that commit, if I just change it and rewrite it, it can potentially introduce conflict and merge conflicts, which we're going to talk about probably in another video. Uh, it's gonna. It can introduce these conflicts that are that might be difficult to resolve, and potentially, if not handled correctly, can you know uh, result in some data loss. Although you would have to like really, uh, it would just cause a little headache, really, and someone's gonna like eventually search it on the internet and figure out the solution. <laughs> uh, anyways, now if we hit hit uh, push, it's gonna be a problem because it's gonna say uh, that our histories are different, and it's like okay. There, the pull latest change from remote repository, it says it was rejected because the tip of your current branch is behind its remote counterpart. And what we can do is we can force push. Force pushing means I don't care what the upstream, what's on GitHub, whatever I have is the truth. You're going to play the Ministry of Truth. And I'm going to tell you right now, do not do this in production. Force pushing is bad. When it, so what could have happened is someone could have their commits on GitHub there, right? On that branch. Uh, you shouldn't work, bo you both shouldn't work on the same branch, which is one of the reasons why uh, why you shouldn't work on the same branch because one of you could force push it <laughs> and then you would like uh, delete the other person's pro progress, obviously, right? So do not work on master, uh, work on other branches. But... Uh, in this case, I'm going to show you what a force push does. So I'm going to click force push. This is a chance it could fail because it was the first commit. Sometimes it's, oh yeah, no, it's fine. So in this case, I successfully uh, changed the commit on master and I pushed it. And it was like, I don't know how to like put that together. Like it's a different thing. And what we chose to do was, um, yeah, um, just forget what's on GitHub, uh, use this. And now if we go into GitHub and we refresh this, you can see that now two faces are there. There's me and there's Draxus. So obviously now it's very, you know, intentional and we have a commit that makes sense. You can see that only the title, if I go to commit here, you can see that only the title, the first line of our commit shows here. Then we can hit a little three, three buttons to see the uh, description and also the, the co-author thing. But GitHub is smart enough to figure out, oh yeah, like this is Drexis as well. And uh, in the statistics of our repository, if we care about that, uh, I think insights, uh, it's going to show that, hey, Drexis actually worked on this as well. So it actually counts towards his contribution. I don't know if it counts towards his contribution. Did we inflate his little... Oh, yeah, we did. So <laughs> so congratulations. We gave Drexis a little contribution for today. I, like, you can... Uh, we can... Uh, <laughs> we, we're kind of nice, I guess. Um like that way we could probably commit like because you can change the commit date as well we could uh like specifically pick different date to like write a little l here just to or like like we could write a little smiley with commits on his little uh contribution uh board or chart which would be kind of fun but again I, I don't this is not what version control is for but just so 
just whatever. So now let's see how branching would work. So let's say we want to work on a new feature, but we don't want to work on master because we are already shook. We're like afraid. It's like, okay, we worked on master. It was a scary thing. It told us like that we shouldn't do it when we already, like we shouldn't amend things when, uh, or yeah, we shouldn't amend commits when they're already live. Like it was really or spooky and stuff. And we learned that br branching is the way to go. So what we're going to do here is we're going to click on branches here. Uh, nope, apparently not. Uh, we're going to click on the branch that we want to branch off of. If you remember in the last video, uh, branches uh, were based on some commit. From some one commit, you could branch off. And obviously, we want to branch off the uh, latest master uh, commit. Right. So again, don't forget that uh, branches are essentially just labels pointing to a commit. So when I right click on master here, I'm like, it's kind of equivalent to like right clicking here, really, except with like, it's probably not going to show me the same options. But I can, what I can do is I can create a branch from a master. And I'm going to maybe, uh, this is again up to you. You can, um, you can come up with your own branching naming scheme. Uh, in my case, um, maybe it's like, maybe we have a, uh, a little agreement that it's like Peter for like who made the branch and then maybe what, what are we doing? Like, um, uh, I don't add project files, right? That's, that's what I'm like supposed to do or like whatever. I'm maybe it's just like a project, right? Or maybe I have an issue tracker and I'm going to, uh, like type in the ID of the, the, uh, the issue or the task that I'm working on. This is up to you. Uh, in general, what I normally do, I just type in the task, so something like add uh, basic project structure, right? That's something that I would probably do, um, except in this case, I'm just going to say Peter project, right? Um, we're going to create a branch here. Let's hit create a branch. And now you can see that we are on this branch. Now, how do I know which branch I'm on? And in this case, I can visually see that there's a little like a little arrow pointing to the branch. If I double click on master here, uh, it's going to be like, hey, do we want to check it out? Yes, I want to check it out. Bam. Now it's master, right? I can double click here. Check out. Bam. Now I'm here. It's not as smooth and as like uh, kind of like nice as other uh, Git um, GUIs, but uh, it, it does. Uh, it does the job. Well, so now when we are on this branch over here, we want to commit the rest of our changes, which is the, the rest of the files, right? So I'm going to hit commit here. And in this case, I'm going to just add everything. I'm just going to hit this stage button. Oh, stage all, sorry. Uh, which adds everything in here. But here's the problem. There are files that I don't want. There's an exe file. There's a DLL file. Uh, these files I obviously don't want to stay, so I'm going to actually take it back. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold up. I should not push uh, binary files, which is this is basically what it is, uh, and debug files either. Uh, because, well, you know, this file is going to change every time because people make changes to the application, so they recompile it, and the entire exe changes, or at least a good chunk of it, which is a lot of... Uh, a lot of data that you're like wasting, you know. So what we're going to do, we're going to utilize something called a git ignore. Because one option is to just like be careful about it and make sure that nobody ever forgets that when you like uh, add all that, you need to take the exe and like uh, take it out of there or like and all the DLLs. But it's like someone's going to forget sooner or later. Someone is going to forget. Uh, so instead, we can add a new file called git ignore, which can... Um, uh, specify what to ignore and in dotnet um we have we what we're able to do we can just say dotnet i'm oh, sorry i'm going to do it in the root of our uh of our uh repository i'm going to i'm guessing i can say dotnet new git ignore which is going to create a new git ignore file now you can see that there are only three things to commit. Interesting. Well, what are the things? It's program CS, the CS proj of the the uh, co 
console application and the gitignore file. Now, what is in the gitignore file? Well, it's fairly readable. It specifies in like a, a format, in like a fairly readable format, what it's supposed to ignore. It's supposed to ignore every file that ends with an RS user, every file that ends with an SUO, right? Also, every directory that begins either with a capital D or lowercase d ebug, debug, and it doesn't matter. Capital debug, lowercase debug, it's going to be ignored. Why is this a folder? Well, because it ends with a forward slash. So that directory, entire directory should be ignored, right? And so you can add like even your own files in here. If you have a super secret password file, you could type it, you could either, oh, sorry, I can't edit it from, I can't edit it from here. I have to go here to the get ignore. I can, uh, yeah, sure, notepad is going to be fine. Um, and we can, uh, we can add uh, anywhere in this file, we can add our own, right? Maybe we can have uh, like passwords.txt, right? That would ignore the entire, the every file called passwords.txt everywhere or secret uh, data forward slash meaning a folder called secret data and anything that's inside it would be ignored right i'm not gonna like do this in this case but obviously you can um if you have a certain specific thing now you don't have to usually write these get ignores you can see that dotnet actually comes with a uh with a new template for it uh, but you can also uh search for it so for example if you have if you're working on an angular application uh get ignore you can probably find a get ignore for that um probably generator oh there's a generator for the get ignore files ah, wh whatever you're working on um it's usually you're usually going to be able to like search for a uh, get ignore file that suits you now that i have that i can actually more clearly see what i'm doing and i'm going to stage all of these files and i'm going to say that i add console app I'm not going to give a description we're not going to bother draxis anymore uh let's just commit this and again i need to um, I need to provide my uh, PGP encryption key and I've got this now if I push this it's again going to say a similar thing it's going to say yeah but like this branch doesn't exist there do you want me to uh, to push that branch I'm like yeah no worries and it's like okay but I don't should I track it as well it's like yes this is not a one off thing I want to keep track of that branch now, if I do that, now you can see that we've got another green origin branch. And if I go to GitHub and uh, refresh, it also tells me that like, hey, you rec your recently pushed branches It's like, hey, this is a thing you did. Um, I can see that there are two branches here and I can also switch between the branches here. So if I go to like SRC, there's just a solution file. But if I switch to the Peter project branch, I have all of my files, including the program CS, right? So good, good. So what we can do, we could probably like make some changes to uh, to this to this branch and um, push further commits. And we're going to because I'm going to show you one more very cool thing, actually two or three more very cool things. So one more thing that we're going to do is we're going to I already closed commander for no reason, really should not have done that. This is going to cost us some time. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make something cool, uh, and that's a readme file. So number one is we're going to create a new file in our little work directory over here in the root of our, uh, in the root of our project. Uh, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code, which is a very lightweight, uh, code editor. Uh, and I'm going to create a readme, all caps, readme.md which stands for markdown. I'm going to create this file. And you can see that I don't need package JSON. What are you saying? Um, I'm going to also make this bigger. Oops, can I? Nope, that's smaller. The opposite of what I wanted. Uh, so number one is get like get tutorial project or repository. 
Um, what I can do is I can have a simple markdown, which uh, you can, there, there's, you should look down, look down, mm -hmm. look down for markdown. You should look up markdown syntax for all the different things that you can do. In Visual Studio Code, you can, when you have a markdown file open and you have it set as markdown, auto detect, it auto detected uh, markdown by dot MD. Uh, there's a little button here called open preview. And if you open preview, it shows you what it's going to look like. So you can see that a hashtag in front of a, at the beginning of a line is a is a uh, big header, you know. Two is a smaller one. Three is an even smaller one. What you can do is like have a uh, like a, a list of, and you can use like the little uh, little syntax for just like kind of like in Discord. If you're familiar, you can like put two stars around the thing to make it like uh, uh, was it cursive or two to make it bold, right? List of things, right? Like uh, something something else something nested right like you can have these things special things on github are uh checklists checklist one it doesn't show here but as you're gonna see um check well that's a checked item right check item um as, you, as you're going to see, this will actually resolve as like a little checkbox, uh, which is either checked or not checked. Uh, you're going to see in, oh, actually, I think it's like that, right? Uh, we might be wrong and that might, GitHub might actually tell us. I forgot. Uh, I'm kind of worried now. <laughs> um, all right, so that's one thing. Uh, but what we're going to, yeah, we're just going to, and this is like... Uh, a uh, place where you would describe your project. You would type in what it's written in, what is it for, how do you run it, uh, how would one install it, what they should know before they run the application, that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to keep this open because we're going to return to it in just a bit. Uh, now, I almost committed from the terminal over there, so I'm actually going to commit through the GUI. Again, I'm going to click commit. I'm going to make sure that everything I want to commit is there. Uh, call it add readme. I would even suggest it even auto complete, which is actually really cool, not gonna lie. Um, yeah, I added a readme.empty and I'm gonna commit this change again, right? Cool. And I can push it directly, right? Again, push it to GitHub. Now, when I do that, we're gonna see something interesting, and that's here on GitHub. If I change from master to my Peter project branch, you can see that the readme file is automatically picked up by GitHub and it's automatically displayed here. And you can see that also our little, uh, our little file, uh, sorry, our little checkbox isn't correct. So let's assume that someone fixes it for us, right? Someone goes to this branch and someone from the GitHub uh, page, they do this so that they can... It, did they lose the, did they lose the, I think it was in front of that, wasn't it like that? No, I, I, I forgot, maybe checkboxes are no longer a thing or I can just like not, uh, I can just like not do it anymore. Oh, see, it's like that, it's in front of it, that's weird, it didn't used to be that way, I don't like it anymore. Okay, so I can say fix check. Uh, items. So someone does that. You can, by the way, make commits like this from GitHub itself, but obviously this is not ideal uh, because obviously you wouldn't want to just edit code there. You could edit a readme file there, that's fine, but like code wouldn't be ideal. So if you actually check this out, uh, now you can see that there are four commits, one of which is, the last one is fix check items. And you can see that it appears just like any other commit, and I did that from my GitHub account, um, except uh, obviously, I don't have it locally. Well, so what we need to do, two things. One of them is fetch. Fetch means I just want to see what changed on the origin. So I can do a fetch, which is going to happen there. And then it's going to be like, well, yeah, but like you can see here that now my branch is behind. There's this fix check items uh, commit that I don't have. I'm still stuck on this add readme. So that's when I use a pull. So I'm just gonna, ooh, uh, pull merge is in this case what it's supposed to, but can I just like click pull, pull merge? Yeah, that's the default. Um, we already talked in the last video why that's the case, right? You need to pull and merge. So we're gonna hit pull merge 
And there you go, we're synced again. I have all the changes that are on GitHub again. So now my checkboxes work. So now the next thing that we're gonna do is we're just simply going to add another uh, project to our .NET application. And in this case, it's just going to be a .NET new X unit, um, unit test application. Um, call it my work tasks. It's always good to X U int mm -hmm, X U knit. And we're just going to generate that. And then we're going to, uh, my work SLN add uh, my work tests. We're just going to add that built net, uh, build because we can do dot net build and we can also dot net test which should work. But before I do that, and before I forget for there are specific reasons for what I'm about to do, but um, I forgot that uh, our application, I have a, this is unrelated to Git, uh, but I have a .NET 5 preview installed and I actually need, uh, need to have this as net core app. Ooh, I forgot, hold up, let me just double check super, super quickly. Uh, 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 uh. Get up. Get up, calm, control net, uh, muni is a good example. I think it's net core app, but I just don't want to like risk getting it wrong and uh, then like suffering for like another five minutes. Yes, net, net core app. Yeah, net core app 3.1 is going to be fine for the target framework. All right, got it right. Just to be sure though, I'm just going to change the target framework because the thing that I'm about to uh, showcase is not going to be really happy. Um, if I keep it as like a preview of um, .NET 5. All right, so here. Um, Obviously, if you're watching this into the future and like .NET 5 is like released and it's fine, then obviously you can use that. Anyways, unrelated. So we're going to come at this changes, these changes. Now, we don't just add new files. Well, we do, but like we also add uh, modify files. And here you can see uh, a bit more uh, what we did, right? Like obviously here it says, oh, you know, you like remove, you like capped net, right? But you removed the 5.0 and you added the core app 3.1, which is technically true. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to stage everything here and I'm going to say like, I don't know, like add unit test project. I'm going to commit this, these changes, right? Now I'm going to, and also let's just, I think we have a sample test there. There's a, an empty test that just passes because, well, it is empty and it doesn't do anything, right? So in unit test, we have an empty test, which is always going to pass. So anyways. Now we're going to push this. We're going to push this to GitHub. This is the, this is the flow, right? We did some changes. Then we just, you know, commit, bam, push, bam, easy. Now we've got these, this thing here and we're ready. We're kind of ready with everything that we're doing here. And we want to now merge it into master. We can either do that from uh, our repository here from our local and then push master or that's a bit more common, you would want to do that here from GitHub. It even shows you, hey, maybe you want to do a, a compare and pull request, right? So I can, if I if I lost this, if this did, wasn't here, right? I could switch to the, pro, switch to, um, the branch uh, that I'm working on, that I'm ready to merge, and I can hit pull request here, which is going to open this little dialogue. It's Peter Project, which is, I'm just going to say add... Uh, unit test, uh, add like uh, add project files, right? And I would again here, I would want to be descriptive. I would like add that all the descriptions of what I'm doing. You know, I can use uh, assign people to it. I can uh, assign myself to the to the pull request. I can add different labels, right? And I should do that. I should if I have projects, I should assign the projects and and milestones, and I should probably do like all that stuff. Uh, if this is a real, uh, real project. And I also see what I changed, which are mostly just added things. Now I'm going to create a pull request. This is merging Peter project into master, right? So I'm going to create pull request. Uh, 
which is just not gonna merge it immediately. As you can see, it's still separate here. But in pull requests, anyone else can like check out my pull request, see the changes. If they go to changes, they can see what I did. They can comment on it. Like, uh, yikes, you know, they can just like com comment or, or like help me or maybe request some changes. They can review my changes, right? Here they can approve or request some changes. Obviously, I can't approve or uh, request changes on my own uh, pull request. But um, which I might, I mean, I kind of would like, well, no, actually, I shouldn't approve my own <laughs> merge request now that I think about it. Um, and when it's ready, I could hit merge pull request, which is going to confirm the merge. And it's going to, and I can also delete the, the branch when I, if I don't need it anymore. And I don't need it, so I'm just going to delete the branch as well. Um, and now I'm, if I go back to code, you can see that I'm in master. There's no other branch and all of my code is here. You can see that the readme is here. I think that was in master anyways, but not sure. Uh, we have our tests uh, here. And now here in my local, my local repository on my computer, if I yet again fetch, uh, you're going to see that, hey, like this is going to disappear, right? It's like, well, actually the, the branch, the, the Peter Project branch, it, it like exists on uh, the remote, but I'm missing this one merge commit here. So first of all, I can go to master, which is which it says that it's five commits behind. Uh, there you can see, see a little graphic there, and I can pull that, pull merge that. It's going to fast forward. It's going to do a fast forward merge again. Check out the last video for that, and then I can delete uh, the, the Peter project branch because it's unneeded, and I'm just going to delete it. Right, and now I don't have it here. Uh, now, it is still here in the origin, which is kind of concerning. I don't think it should be there. We can delete that. I don't think it should be there because it really isn't on the... Uh, can I fetch? What if I fetch? Is it going to freak out? Because that doesn't exist. Yeah, see? Couldn't find reboot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that... Well, it doesn't exist. I don't need it. I can delete it. Um... Actually, this seems like a weird little bug. Oh, fetch and prune, maybe? Fetch with prune will remove all the remote tracking references which no longer exist on remote. Ah, there you go. That's exactly what we wanted. That's what we wanted. Fetch and prune. Right. Prune juice. I don't know. I'm sorry. So... Now, this is the flow, and this is the flow. I would create a new, so uh, to recap it, I would create a new branch. I would make my changes to it. Commit, push, commit, push, commit, push. I will make changes, commit, push, make changes, commit, push. And then when I'm ready, I would go to GitHub, create a pull request. Someone would review it. They would merge it. And at that point, I go back. I check out my master pull that because it now has my change. I'm going to pull that master. Then I'm going to delete my uh, extra branch that I no longer need if it got deleted, that is. Um, and then I can optionally fetch and prune to get rid of uh, any like uh, or, uh, remotes that are no longer uh, available in on the, on the remote, in our case, on origin. Now, all right, so that's it. But I'm going to give you one last tip, like a cool thing here. Um, this is an extra bonus tip. If you're working in .NET and if you have tests, um, even if you don't have tests really, you can uh, check out GitHub Actions because that's really cool for your project. I think a lot of you will really like it. Um, you can set up a workflow, set up a .NET Core workflow if you have .NET Core. And it's going to open this up, right? And um, basically, CI/CD is a continuous integration and continuous deployment. It basically makes sure that your application is buildable, it, that it builds, uh, and potentially all of the tests pass on um, every commit that you push. Right, so you can push a commit, and it's going to tell you, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, hold up! You made some, you made some changes, and the application cannot build anymore." And that's good to know. That's really good to know so that you don't merge anything into master that cannot actually compile. Maybe that's what you want, except uh, with one change here, because we don't have our project immediately in the in the uh, directory. We actually have an SRC direct, subdirectory. So I'm going to say .NET build SRC and .NET test SRC forward slash, right? It's the only difference for, for us in this case. An extra tip as well, 
if this is a multi-platform project is let's go to github.com um, control net uh, muni we can just directly copy that from muni uh, because we have uh, a workflow there's a uh, matrix for yeah so so runs on which is this thing can use a resource we can say uh, runs on matrix.os right runs on it could be matrix.os and then we can define that matrix in the strategy part directly after that maybe and we can actually make sure that it runs on ubuntu latest windows latest and mac os latest basically ensuring that it is truly uh, multi-platform or at least that it builds on these platforms it doesn't have to run there um unit tests wouldn't ensure that front end would work unless it's a, an integration test i'm still getting distracted so then we can commit it i'm going to commit it directly to master uh, of course you would want to make a branch for it and all that and once you do that if you go to actions again you're going to see that hey uh well you don't have any workflows yet uh they're going to load i swear oh there it is and now we can see if we check it out, we can see all these three things running. There are three queued jobs. And if you open up, open that up, you can see, hey, it's doing some work, right? It's set up uh, a new environment. It basically gets a virtual machine there uh, with uh, Ubuntu in this case. It's going to try to install dependencies. This fails for some reason. That's because I think there was .NET Restore. And I don't think I did .NET Restore with the SRC. So actually, let me edit that real quick. This is again my fault. It's .NET Restore SRC. Yep. This is what happens with uh, CICD. You basically like have a trial and error. This is why it's good to have it on a separate branch because you're gonna like edit the pipeline 27 times before it actually builds, right? So this one failed because the restore couldn't restore. Basically went into the home directory of the uh, of the repository, did .NET restore, and it's like nothing happens. It's like what? It needs to be .NET restore SRC, and then it's gonna be like yeah, okay. Now this one, the the edited one now. Uh, yep, that installs dependencies, it builds, it should run the test, the test should complete, there's one successful test, I guess, and there you go, and that builds it. But here's a little cool thing, what we can do, <coughs> we can get a, if we click on the pipeline, in this case it's called .NET Core, we can create a status badge, and we can just get the default status badge, hit a copy status badge markdown, go to our readme, paste it, and we're going to have a cool little, it says failing, it's not updated yet. Uh, we can get that. Let's commit that real quick. Let's commit it. Bam. Add badge. You can see that it's like fairly quick, right? If you know what you're doing, add badge. You're going to get a griff. You're going to like, you're going to get into it, right? Just bam, bam, bam. Push, push, push. It's for me. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it's missing that. So pull it first. And then push it, please. Uh, I still find it a lot easier to just do it through the command line, but that's just me. You can you can get really efficient here, I think, with uh, with this. And then you can see that here you can sue as well. Uh, you can see that we have a status here, and it says that well, there's no status yet because it's still uh, working on it. If we go to our actions, uh, you can see that we have. Uh, two things still in progress to commit. Uh, I think Windows should be slowing it down, right? Yes, yeah, see, that's what, that's what I'm saying. And people tell me like, hey, Windows is good. Windows is fast. Like, no, it's not. What do you mean? It's just, it's just still working on something. What is it even doing? It's still building. I mean, one would say that, that .NET Core is a Microsoft thing. Like, well, why wouldn't it be like done? It's like, well, you need to spit up a VM of uh, Windows. That's expensive. It's like, uh, uh, can we just use Linux? Like, I'm sorry, you know. And it's not even like saying that, you know, the next one is still, it's still Windows. It's just, we're still waiting on Windows. And it's still just installing dependencies and stuff. We're going to wait for that. It's like, well, Peter, why are your tutorials so long? It's like, well, because Windows doesn't cooperate. That's definitely it. It's not me rambling. That's, it's Windows. Bumma Windows. All right, so... Once this is going to finish, we should hopefully see the update. We're probably going to still like wait for the, for, first of all, for Windows to do its thing. Second of all, for like 43 seconds for dependency install. Ugh. Oh, that's actually, I think oh, you can, um, 
uh, this is the initial setup. You can uh, avoid that with an environment variable. But anyways, uh, this is for a different video. Um, yes, so we've got our pipeline building now. And if we go to code, eh, it's still not updated. I and oh yeah yeah there we go passing and now we know that our master branch is buildable and everyone else knows it as well it's green it's cool right we're like so cool and that's it and that's it that's it for uh, this video about uh, Git uh, extensions as a GUI and I think it's it's pretty good you can see how the history went. Uh, you can see it visually, committing is easy, pulling, pushing, adding a, uh, a remote. We've tried it all. I think it's good. So I hope you liked the video. And um, if you did, then please, um, I guess, rate this video somehow. I don't know what it does. Um, and uh, in the next video, we're going to hopefully take a look at some other topics, such as GPG encryption, which basically means... Uh, getting the little verified swag next to your commits so that everyone knows that it was definitely Peter who screwed up this little commit. Uh, and um, nobody can pretend to be me failing. Uh, and we're going to take a look at some other topics and like uh, interactive uh, rebasing and some complex things. We're going to go through Git Catas and uh, resolving some common problems. Uh, we're also going, I'm also going to recreate this video with different um, Git GUIs. So stay tuned for that as well as with just a terminal so that you can take a look, try it out, see what's, uh, you know, what, what your favorite approach is. All right, that's going to be it. The video is an hour long that wasn't even like close to what i was predicting whatever all right i'll i'll see you guys in the next video thank you for being here with me uh, i'll see you later bye